Sunday, 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 right here on twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. It's the Plex, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific and on into red light. We have the worst news in the week that no one else will cover. The Plex has it all. Conspiracy, right-wing nut jobs, Christian extremism, and Madison Star Moon. Tune in every Sunday at 7 p.m. Pacific at twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media and find our full schedule at Echoplex Media dot com okay i'm white and i've got everything i need no one clutches their purses when they're in a room alone with me and i can drive for any neighborhood i please at any hour and the police don't do a thing so if i see a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I got everything I need I'm a guy getting paid more than a girl with a degree And I can walk down the streets after dark No one wants to rape me And I can get a girl pregnant And just as easily flee like my straight white male dad did to me So if I see a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need I've got a pile of broken mirrors And I'm walking under ladders And I'm spilling tons of salt But to me that doesn't matter Cause my skin and my gender and my orientation Are the best things to have if you live in this nation I recommend it highly So if I see a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Shit's gonna work out for me Cause I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Hey everybody, welcome to the Intellectual Dollar Tree. We do the show live every Wednesday at 7pm Pacific right here on twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. Uh, you can check out our new swag shore, store at eplex.shop I, uh, just to make things more confusing for Matt when he reads out the tech show. Anyway, I'm, I'm producer Dave. You can find me on Grinder. Uh oh. I don't have you. I don't have sound from you. <laughs> what, have, you don't even have to try unplugging it and plugging it back in. You just have to try plugging it in. <laughs> yep. There we go. I am HK Perrin. You can find me right here every uh, every Wednesday. Uh, for the intellectual dollar tree and you find me on uh, Twitter at HK Perrin and you can also find me every Wednesday uh, on YouTube at our new show. How the tech are you? Fantastic. That, that post, did that post today? Yes. Cool. Well, I'm uh, slack. Like I'm half slack. an hour ago. <laughs> I'm slow. Oh, you're slacking too. Yeah. There was no way I was going to get the audio version <laughs> up then. So, um, I don't know. I guess we're just going to jump right into it. I didn't know what we were going to watch and then. I figured out what we were going to watch. Um, this is an odd, oddball thing that we're going to watch here because uh, a lot of things I could say about it, Mr. Andy Nogo here, and I'll probably leave uh, leave them up to everyone's imagination. Uh, James Lindsay was running around saying that everybody LGBTQ open open about it or willing to talk about it was a groomer. So here he is with a gay guy, Andy No, who's just going to agree with him about that. I apparently. We're going to talk about uh, James Lindsay's Twitter suspension and, um, I don't know, all kinds of other stuff that might actually get us a little no-no from Twitch. We'll see how it goes here. <laughs> Hi, James. Thanks uh, so much for making time with me. Uh, also, he's never lived. He's he's not from the UK. Just keep I that in mind as he speaks. I this interview and this opportunity to talk because... Who, Andy, um, no? Yeah, not from the UK. Actually, a number of years. Okay. It's, Weird for me to think that back in my early days of journalism, you were one of the first people I met, one of the first I interviewed um, back in Portland, Oregon in 20, 
So was it 2017 or 2018 that the that accent he's putting on is actually a Portland accent scandal story came out there was an 18 yeah it's been a while yeah I remember uh, you Helen Peter Bogosian uh, interviewed you uh, in a room um, oh in a room you say wow oh, fucking riveting and yeah. those were the days a, a lot has changed in this movement i guess at that time that was kind of pre-idw early idw i mean that whole entire thing was falling. oh how mad are both of these people that they didn't get to take that picture in front of that fucking plant <laughs> right like how mad are they are they still mad about that they probably stay mad yeah but you know your profile has grown significantly people are, you know are obviously familiar with your um works on explaining critical race theory i think you are probably one of the very no not now. explaining critical race theory like, redefining critical race theory making he things has admitted that he was redefining critical race theory that was chris Ruffo, dude Oh, was it? Yeah, that was the one who was just out and proud about how if we call any racial, if we tar and feather the idea of critical race theory, and then we call any, like, call any movement or any sort of um, push towards uh, diversity and inclusion critical race theory, then that's what we're going to do. That's He, like, tweeted it out. It's a different guy. We can watch Chris Rufo talk that's to Jordy right. Pete during the post game if you want. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But James Lindsay also has not ever actually explained in a real way uh, critical race theory. Well, not for nothing. I mean, he's, his degree is in math and critical race theory is like a, like an esoteric theory of law that not a lot of people in law school even study. So yeah, <laughs> the United States who helped mainstream and distill a lot of these really complicated far left um, academic theories, um, for a wider audience to be able to better understand um you i mean yeah so and now you started for a while now new discourses and anyways i've been a fan of your work for a long time a lot of the people watching this um will be fans as well and unfortunately very recently you were permanently suspended from twitter and I wanted to talk to you about that. Um, you were very unapologetic in um, using um, OK Groomer, using the term groomer to refer to people who were ideologically grooming children. In the or just anybody who happened to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender who had the fucking balls to talk back to James Lindsay. <laughs> yeah, like, is... Okay, so if, if you just say... I'm gay. Is that grooming children? Um, it just depends on whether or not you're Dave Rubin, I think. Okay. Because they wouldn't accuse him of that. Are you sure? I mean, maybe, I don't know. Maybe they'll throw, maybe they'll throw him under the fucking, maybe they'll throw him under the big gay bus at one day, to, one day too. Who knows? Yeah. Like into a certain political ideology um i were you the one who actually coined like that in this particular context so i want to be as fair and honest as possible i have no you don't formed with <laughs> evidence provided that it had been used by other people before i started doing it but i thought that i yeah but people were using it in like a context like <clears throat> where there are certain streamers who shall remain nameless who had members of their community who were there before they were the member of the community was 18 and then started dating that person like shortly after they became 18 and people were like okay groomer <laughs> you know <laughs> like because that's yeah. that's and still that's like maybe maybe that happened maybe it didn't maybe it was fair maybe it wasn't but that was sort of the context in which i had seen it previously was where it looked like that might be the case like where the person was where somebody was trying to get somebody else for themselves right yeah if there's no romantic relationship involved or no attempted romantic relationship then there's no grooming well romantic might be uh might be a charitable word yeah uh tos and all that 
Yeah, yeah, okay. Gun it. I did not know other people were doing it, and I started doing it on Twitter, and I probably am the person who popularized it. Uh, radical feminists apparently had been doing it in their forums and sometimes uh, in public-facing accounts to go after trans activists as well uh, for a period of time before that. But but so that's not good. I that I was the first person to ever do it, but I think I can claim credibly that I was the one who popularized it and kind of drove it into the mainstream. So in that very long introduction I just did, I also... I wasn't the person who started the disease, but I sneezed on the most people once I got it. Right, I didn't invent typhoid, I was just the Mary. Thanks. Um, you've written a book on critical race theory. So you, you've done a hell of a lot in just a few years. But I, I, I'm trying to map out like how you got from, because when I knew you actually in 2017, 18, 19, you were so unapologetically left wing and so anti-Trump. And now I think a significant portion of your supporters that I see online are conservative, Christian, um, Trump supporters. How did how do these two worlds in your you know previous views i don't know if you still hold on to those views actually like how do you get from there to, to here is what i'm asking well if i might paraphrase the great thomas soul uh, facts <laughs> uh as it turns out you know the left has been going as, as you know as well as anybody or better in some ways than, than most people the left has gone off the cliff um I don't know that I am technically conservative. I get identified that way a lot now. Uh, my views, however, yeah, you get of called the far left right. and of what enables <laughs> the left. Oh, I know. I got told the human rights campaign put out a thing recently saying that I use alt right terminology like cultural Marxism, uh, which is just a term that's been used for over 100 years. So how it's alt right terminology now. That's not what HRC's talk. I mean, they may have mentioned that in what they had written about Lindsay, but they're not talking uh, the human rights campaign. Remember them equal signs that were going around on everybody's car like before gay mm -hmm. marriage? They were like on every car in the fucking Bay Area. Yeah, it was like the the yellow equal signs on like a purple background i think it was yeah that uh, that's a that's a lgbtq rights organization or whatever they are definitely they brought him up or were talking about him because of this trans and like queer moral panic that he's participating in they may have also brought mm -hmm. up some of the other stuff he's doing saying that it aligns with far right other far right ideologies but he's like He's like burying the lead and I don't even know what they wrote about him, but I know that, that because of the focus of the organization that it was this stuff, you know? Yeah. Mystery to me. But um, anyway, watching through 2019 and 2020 when in a sense woke stopped being fun and just this stupid but dangerous thing that was happening primarily in academia and kind of in some of these, you know, circles in journalism and it turning into something that had gripped the culture completely and then studying its its antecedents and uh, it, its kind of uh, trajectory into the public uh, led me to completely reject that and completely reject everything that enables it. And so it's funny you bring up that a lot of my, my followers and, and friends and supporters are Trump supporters. I frequently remind them that I think I'm more MAGA than they are. Uh, what? I am not in the sense of being all that enamored with Trump personally one way or another, but in the idea of a... Um, make America great again to renew America back to uh, a constitutional republic as as opposed to something that's undergoing a communist. I mean, this is like overdone, but I just wonder like when they say make America great again, like you just go, well, when was that? Yeah. <laughs> and why? <laughs> when yeah. and why? Um, and almost invariably, the answer is the 50s. Yep. Before women could have credit cards and shit. And then it's like, well, were you alive in the 50s? No. Then do you know what it's like then? Right. It's just, it's a pining away for a past that probably never existed. Mm -hmm. Revolution. I'm probably more committed to that cause than the majority of my conservative supporters are. So maybe that's why they call me far right. I don't know. That's um, not what MAGA is, though. Moderate. Well, it's, it's. It's one of those things that just like it means whatever it needs to mean to someone whenever it needs to mean it. Right. It's it's a platitude. Sure. But I, I, I do think that 
for the most part, MAGA started as and is to me like one of the defining features of MAGA is hardline stances on immigration. Like you are against essentially brown people immigrating to the United States. That's that's interesting because the like one of the first like before Trump, uh, Ronald Reagan was saying make America great again. And Ronald Reagan's uh, administration granted a pretty broad amnesty to uh, undocumented folks, you know. But the modern like the Donald Trump started MAGA movement uh, is all about making America a whiter country. Right, but to somebody That's who doesn't... That's their, their idea of greatness is whiteness. Right, but to somebody who doesn't care about immigration or is maybe a second-generation person from Honduras who's in that, maybe, they're, maybe they think America was great before gay marriage or before, I don't know, women's suffrage or... You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's like I said, it's, yeah. just, it's completely meaningless and it allows the, it allows the person who hears it to uh, like sort of uh, project their own ideological ideas onto it. Yes, it's nebulous, but I I would say that the vast majority of of people who identify as MAGA are white and to a certain extent would agree with white nationalist views. Sure, because they're white nationalists and they're projecting what they believe onto the phrase make America great again. That's why the phrase well, like if that's it, why the phrase was able to bring in people who might not agree on issues but are just like have certain bigotries and biases it's because it's you don't it doesn't actually say anything yeah but if we're going to define it like like james Lindsay is trying to do then i think his definition is a very poor one that's what that's what i'm saying is that it it isn't for you it's for james Lindsay, and he can project onto <laughs> it what he wants all right, yeah, that's On that's a good point. Points, to him, it's something completely different. The, uh, inclusion uh, of what boils down to communism in a new form in the United States, which I feel unambiguously has no no place here, and I want to see it completely removed, except as a matter of private belief that people are entitled to have under the Constitution. But he under, the Constitution, under the Constitution, under the Constitution. Under the Constitution, we're also allowed to organize and vote and redress the government for our grievances. So he's just wrong there about like your rights to be a communist. In America, you have the right to be a communist and you have the right to organize. It's just wrong. Does, does he mean communists or communism? Because as far as I know, no part of America is communist. Am I incorrect? I like I said, he's just wrong. I don't. I'm not. Get, I don't want to get into the weeds about every every little thing here. Um, okay, so either way you interpret it, he's still wrong. Well, he's just if if I have the right to personally believe that under the Constitution, we also have the right to organize under those principles. Yeah. Okay, so ex explain what, what you mean when you're talking about communist revolution, because. Um, you know, I, I'm in the space of researching and writing about communist ideologues, militants, and particularly the anarchist communist manifestation in Antifa. And I see a lot of times with Republican politicians at their political events, they will throw around these terms like Marxist, socialist, um, Democrats, communists, and kind of use it um, as if they were all synonyms. I, I mean, I know that they're, they're doing it for political reasons, political partisan reasons. I think it's inaccurate, but um, I mean, describing what's happening now on the mainstream left as a communist revolution is is pretty strong. Can you can you clarify? Uh, and because when I think of communist revolution, let's say I'm. You know, my family background of parents who lived through a communist revolution in the form of a collapse of an entire regime of South Vietnam, the dissolution of their country and the imprisonment, literal imprisonment, prison camps of anybody who's affiliated with the former government. That was the reason for the huge diaspora and refugee crisis out of Vietnam after the end of the uh, Vietnam War in 75. So I think of it kind of more in that terms. Um, and it sounds hyperbolic when you're describing 
America now is in the midst of communist revolution, but I, I don't want to misstate your words, or maybe I'm not understanding you. <laughs> no, I mean, I would understand why you would see it as hyperbolic, but I see that that's because the conditions under regimes like we saw arise in Vietnam or in Korea before that, or in China before that, or in you know the Eastern Bloc before that, or in uh, Russia before that. So these kinds of models of communist revolutions, those were very 20th century in terms of their technology and implementation. We're not in the 20th century anymore. China has spent the last 20, 25 years developing and enabling and implementing a social credit system. They've spent the last, you know, several decades developing. Yeah, but here we just have a capitalist credit system. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you're, there are a ton of things that you can do to hurt your credit that have absolutely nothing to do with whether you can pay back a loan. Right. And I don't know, I guess like systems are always like once a system becomes sufficiently complex, something like that is probably bound to arise. I don't know for sure, like because it's like I don't have like a bunch of models that we can run on it or whatever, but it seems like if a system becomes complex enough, something like that's going to arise anyway. Just that here in America, you, you're dealing with Experian or whoever and you know not for nothing they've had some major problems and if you've ever tried to get something off your credit score that wasn't true or you know maybe you were the victim of fraud you know you might you might wish you were dealing with the dmv after a couple of weeks of trying to deal with it like yeah so like it's not unique to to china it's just that they they've implemented it on a state level i don't i don't think i don't think either are fucking all that great i'm not sure which i prefer a mass surveillance um, system so yeah. uh, if we were to dip into the fancy terminology of the postmodernists what michelle foucault called the carceral continuum they're on a very uh, kind of high-tech surveillance based um exclusion based uh through social credit uh means of 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 carceral behavior they don't have to take people and lock them up in prisons at gunpoint or re-educate them in gulags any longer they can do so through um what they're using in in for the re-education is nudge theory to the to the general public through social media oh no it's not through social media like this nudge theory is like a really old theory you know he's complaining now about a psa essentially you know, you're like listening to the radio and you hear a PSA. It's like, don't litter, you know, keep our water clean, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah. That stuff comes out of what he's just, it's nudge theory. It's where if you, you can nudge people in a direction, you might be able to make some societal improvements by like being like, hey, litter's bad. Throw your trash away. He's talking about that right now. <laughs> Remember, give a hoot, don't pollute. Yeah. Yeah. That's an example of what he's talking about. It's like a little catchy, okay. c- catchy song usually for kids, but they'd be singing it around their parents and shit, you know? Yeah. And that's like, I don't know if it's nudging you in the direction of give a hoot, don't pollute. It seems like a, one of the better things the government can do. One of the better things a powerful institution can do. If they're doing it right, whereas the system like dare was the exact opposite of what we should have done. Right. It probably just made people want to do drugs. Yeah. They're like this one does what i can stay up all night <laughs> i'm 14 fuck yeah well like they wouldn't even tell you what like what the drugs do they would just lie to you about the drugs they would just say like all drugs like you you try any drug and your life is going to be ruined and then you try weed and you're like this is actually pretty good i like this and i feel a lot better the day after smoking weed than i do the day after having like a few drinks so like what else did dare tell me that's completely wrong all right we're off we're we're off we're like off to the side a little bit here let's try to try to yeah. try to bring it back <laughs> media propaganda uh, which is what we call the left media uh they can do so with children through educational devices like social and emotional learning that present them with social and emotional conflict and then give them correct resolution to that in line with doctrine uh, which is a form, a form of programming that models or mirrors, I should say, what Mao was doing in his prisons for his, his re-education prisons. What the uh, fuck? 
so we're seeing it in a new 21st century context enabled by these little black mirrors that we carry around in our pockets uh that create a different set of oh no he didn't just call your come on dude get the fuck out of here oh i i'm i've watched black mirror i know a cultural thing get the fuck out of here imagine like these two guys go out i assume james Lindsay is straight and uh, andy no is gay imagine them going out trying to like get a date like imagine them like his wingmen like in a, in like a buddy comedy except it would be a tragedy <laughs> i just couldn't imagine two less charismatic people if i tried also like is he saying that phones are making people communist well he's saying that they're i don't know if he's saying that he's saying that they're they're what's the the media you're consuming is going to like push you in a certain direction but like that's been the case for media always silent films had that ability the newspaper had that ability like old like fables stories that elders would tell to younger members of the society before we had these kinds of ways of communicating had that impact on people you know what i'm saying these this is yeah this is it's just accelerated by information technology as has as is everything else i would say though information technology makes it a lot more complex because essentially you have like an algorithm dictating changes to society and that algorithm is probably not considering anything about like ethical behavior you know that algorithm is only considering what's going to make people look at my app the longest and usually that's content that makes you angry sure sure i guess but i'm it's just faster like if we if you know i don't again that's like so far down a different rabbit hole what he's saying is that like the ability to transmit information is going to in impact society and it's just that the phone or even a fucking computer versus before everybody had a computer, the, the computers all got connected, right? A BBS could get you information quicker than a newspaper could. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's the information, though, that... Like, I, I'm not saying... I'm not talking about what he's saying, but I don't think it's the information well, I'd like it if that, we would be talking about uh, what the people on the show are saying, <laughs> if that's okay. Okay, but... You know, ac accessing any information is different than accessing specific information. Constraints and, and means for popular or population control. But I don't think that it's ideologically that much different. Of course, by definition, Marxism being a critical dialectical philosophy has to destroy itself and reinvent itself with each new generation. So you see Marxism as a classical form going into vanguard Marxism with Lenin, going into cultural Marxism, going into critical Marxism, going into this kind of utopian woke Marxism that they have now starting about 20 years ago, now shifting into this new utopian form woke Marxism goals or the sustainable development goals of the united nations what is that SG component yeah this is dumb what he's saying here is that times change and that people's sensibilities and the things they care about change with ge over generations and it's not like we're not gonna you know cut it off right at where would you decide the generation is but yeah the fucking sensibilities of people who are like gonna generally be progressive or more liberal are different now than they were 50 years ago yeah like is is saying is like Telling people, hey, you shouldn't say the F A word. Like, is that communism now? Who? Who? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, maybe. I mean, okay, groomer is just another version of that in in, in the end, right? Yeah. Or they're creating a social credit system to control the way that corporations behave uh, and to control the way that institutions have to behave and thus use those as instruments to nudge if you will or to start to con to contour the way that people are going to live we don't need a bread line for example if we have a me a social credit system that says you can't buy xyz until your social credit score is high enough so they you mean like a credit score <laughs> like if you make but also like we don't have a social credit system in the united states Right, but let's, okay, so the credit, uh, let's say you make enough money that you could pay a mortgage, right? If your credit shot for this reason or that, now they're not going to fucking sell you a mortgage. And so now you're stuck renting, and it would be interesting because you, they'd probably say you could afford a higher rent than that mortgage would be. 
So he's like describing a thing that we have. We're just take the word social isn't on it, but it just, it decides what you can buy at your income level. Once the thing that you're going to buy is beyond your means of like reasonably being able to save up and buy it like a house. Yeah. Uh, I should say it is actually, um, what we have kind of is a social credit system because there are aspects uh, there are social aspects that play into your credit score. Right. Like I said, it's in for, in like a lot of ways, it's the same thing. It's just called something else. There's just one less word. Yeah. But there are also things that he would probably be okay with. Well, yeah, he seems to be like a, he seems to be like a pretty, pretty cheerful capitalist, right? Yeah. They can force you to participate in different ways and at the barrel of a gun uh, in this kind of new program. Uh, and I think that that's what we've been unambiguously going through and, and just for the unambiguous part since George Floyd died and they took to the streets in 2020 is that the cultural revolution had come to America. And I'm proud to have actually warned people who worked for the Pentagon in, 20, er, in February of 2020 that this was coming about three months. <laughs> Dear in Pentagon. Advance. <laughs> Uh, I'm sad to say that they did. This guy's an idiot. The Pentagon doesn't like constitutionally does not do anything like doesn't police. The, The military does not do police work. Correct. So he like the Pentagon. Okay. So you wrote an email to the Pentagon. It's like, it's like, cultural revolution at pentagon.gov i mean i don't know what do you who do you email like who, who did he contact <laughs> my friend's dad worked at the pentagon i told him about the cultural revolution and he said okay <laughs> i mean like what the fuck listen to me but uh i do believe that we are going through a a cultural revolution it is a soft almost velvet style revolution or a color revolution as it were as opposed to a kind of overt militaristic coup like you would have seen with the bolsheviks or with with the communists in china taking over for the the guomintang or whatever so when i say that we're going through a communist revolution i mean that quite literally but communism itself has evolved from the crude communism or cruder soviet style communism into this new hybrid model that's been pioneered in china since we opened up the market there and so they have a communist structure with a with a market operating inside of it and you know at its pleasure and that model is being i think brought more global now is it still communism without the economic uh, the economic framework of oh shit andy no accidentally asked this guy a difficult question (laughs) (laughs) is it still communism if there's no communism in it like i guess uh communist theory and ideology so this is an interesting question and i'm glad you asked it uh communism actually precedes Marx, the economic communism uh, that Marx was kind of looking at was something that was already well developed. Um, it mostly was viewed as a small scale solution. We have actually a commune here in Tennessee, rather famously, it's called the Farm, that's been in operation for over a hundred years. Uh, it's not exactly a resort of high health and prosperity, but it's been ongoing for you know two hundred or some odd people for you know generations now. Uh, but in the broader context, when you look at Marxism, I have stepped away from kind of the classical interpretation of Marxism, the academic understanding of Marxism, that Marxism is primarily offering an economic theory. <laughs> I think that Marx actually laid down a theology, that he, he organized a religion, and that material conditions were the uh, the driving center of what he thought uh, made for man's sense of being and purpose in life. <laughs> I reject your reality and insert my own. <laughs> Except he like literally means that. Yeah. <laughs> like if somebody said to me, what is communism? And they didn't really know what it was. My, my first thing would be like, well, at the, at the very base level, it's just a structural critique of capitalism and, and how capitalism fucks the workers. And yeah, you can get more into it, but that's like, uh, that's, it, it, you get too far, you get too much into it and I'm just out of my depth, right? Like I'm not, 
I'm not an expert mm-hmm. on these things. This guy has a math degree and is just making up communism as he goes along to criticize mostly people who were dunking on him on Twitter before he got kicked off on Twitter for calling everybody a groomer. I don't know. I mean, I'm in a tough time with this. <laughs> and so he built a religion and the kind of operant operating uh, system that he plugged into it was economic conditions. So an economic theory got built into a religion uh, that was uh, an underlying theology. And that, that, I think, is something like, kind of like a, a it sounds a little silly. I disagree. A PlayStation isn't any of the games that it plays. It has the capacity to change the game out. So you, Marxism would be like or the, the PlayStation. And then, you know, what we call classical Marxism would be a particular game. But then you can take that disc out and put a different disc in. And when you put the new disc in. Um, but what if you have a disc for a GameCube? <laughs> <laughs> That's capitalism. Oh, <laughs> that, yeah, because you have to go buy another computer to run it. That's right. That is capitalism. Good job. <laughs> I know this is old. They don't use well, like anymore, none of this makes any with, sense. Uh, like I don't know cultural conditions or like uh, like the, communism isn't kind of some like framework that you can plug in like different things into. Communism is about economics, right? And like I said, yo, know, I'm not I'm not an expert on this, but this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Like. I don't have to be an expert on something to know when someone else is also not an expert on something. (laughs) You don't have to know the answer to know what bullshit sounds like. Somebody's like, what's the square root of 109? Well, you're like, well, I can't do that in my head. They're like, it's 114. You're like, nope, that's wrong. (laughs) It's it's bigger that you can't do that. That can't be right. (laughs) <laughs> critical marxism or some identity politics like critical race theory or queer i don't theory. know the exact uh, right answer but i know the answer you just you gave the is same, bullshit you have the same engine you have the same playstation running the game it's just operating a different uh playing a different piece of software so i see our marxism communism way, is like a playstation you put a disc into it and you can play a different game and if you play Leisure Suit Larry on your PlayStation, it's like uh, the, the communism is like redistributing uh, booty. And then if you try and shove Mario 64 in there, you're going to break your communism. And then you have to go to the store and buy a new communism. <laughs> Which is fun. <laughs> we, we shouldn't just redistribute the, the communisms. You have to actually go buy it. And this has been you know, the bulk of my work. That's why Raytheon puts a rainbow logo on their missile during Pride Month. Critical theory, whether it's cultural Marxism, whether it's postmodernism even. Ooh, cultural Marxism is a fucking anti-Semitic dog whistle. That's all. Mm. Uh, which is a change from when I wrote cynical theories. Whether it's this woke stuff, the identity politics, critical race theory, queer theory, post-colonial all of the different fat studies all these things he's just listing the kinds of people who dunked on him on twitter and it's (laughs) the exact same like sociologists historians different if you put it switch metaphors to a car it's the exact same engine with a different body style uh in essence so yeah i still think this is no i like the playstation metaphor because like we need to you know every once in a while i would i'd hit the button to open my communism and then i'd try and close the communism again but it wouldn't close and I'd have to like tap on the button a few times before I could finally close the, the communism again. It's your, um, perfect metaphor. Your, 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 uh, your breadline latch was fucked up. (laughs) Think of the latch as like a gulag that holds. I think it's cause I spilled soda into it once and that made it all gunked up. Communism. If you spill soda into communism, it gets all gunked up. Right, that's why you need to have crappy potato vodka. Yes, much better. Neo-communism, because it's <laughs> introduced the idea of a market to solve the the production problem, and it's introducing the idea of technology to solve the distribution problem. Uh, but it's ultimately still the same goal that all the people have to be on the same page that the as as they say it in in this one book called the politics of education um that the i think is fulfilled in the we think and so it's still a collectivist redistribution no joke though i i have a i have a playstation that only works when it's upside down 
And that makes sense because communism only works when it's upside down. In fact, communism in and of itself is upside down. There you go. <laughs> to where we're supposed to generate a ultimately classless uh, and stateless society in the, the long end of time. With an administered state, where? I should say, in between, because that's what socialism represents for Marx. Did Andy Andy fall asleep with his eyes open while James was talking? <laughs> <laughs> what about for the uh, Democrats and liberals uh, who are on board with... Bad follow-up. My follow-up would be, can you explain that again, except make sense this time? Uh, sort of in the, in the form of they support or help lead or amplify these um, cancel campaigns or trying to implement policies wherever to restrict freedom of expression. When you look at these particular liberals, they're not, I mean, they're not communists. I'm thinking of there are a lot of liberals, let's say in Western Europe, who are supportive of um, restrictions on on speech that they think is hateful and a lot of uh, many american democrats want wish they could emulate that type of uh legislation in the u.s were it not for the first amendment um do, do you find those type of people um fitting into there are already restrictions to the, way, the first like, amendment though right like um i can't i can't use my words to hire a hitman yeah or you can't like you can't incite violence right yeah you can't <clears throat> like we have like conspiracy laws those are those if you were a free speech absolutist you would be against laws that are like rico and stuff like racketeering and stuff yeah. because that's a lot about what people say to one another yeah or like you can't lie to congress correct you can't lie. You not. You can't lie to the police, but they can lie to you. Uh, can you not yeah, lie to the police? What's the relationship? Would you say with um, these neo I mean, I, do. or, uh, I don't know that they're. Martha they, Stewart got busted for. I don't think they know that they're communists. Now, before I get into that, I want to. I don't think they know that they're communists, but I'm going to decide for them. Famous character, kind of in this progression, <laughs> is this woman Angela Davis, uh, very radical, left wing, black activist, black feminist. Um, and she's still active today in the prison abolition and police abolition movement and in education. So she's still alive. She's still active. She's still revered and cited by the far left and by even kind of the mainstream left. Now, these Democrats, you, some of them are, you mentioned as like she's some kind of hero. And she was uh, the vice presidential candidate for the Communist Party USA a few times, at least twice. I don't remember if it was more than twice in the 1970s. And she eventually oh boy, she came close to winning too. Left the Communist Party because she said that it was too right wing. So uh, when we start talking about communism again, as we come out and from 20, 20th century into 21st century, there's been kind of a sea change in how they think. But as far as these kind of people who you would identify as say that they want to have hate speech campaign or, you know, uh, prohibitions and so on. Um, but they certainly, if you ask them, or do you identify as communist, do you, do you ascribe to communist policies or ideas? They would say no. They probably have some socialist ideas in terms of, you know, um, maybe you know socialist medicine or government medicine or or even government education socialist like medicine that. but they don't view themselves anywhere on the communist uh spectrum but what i would say is that what we're what we're doing is it's again we're just misunderstanding what Karl marx actually did which was that he built a theology and if you build a theology then you have i wonder if he would call the highways socialist roads you have lots yeah I, <clears throat> it seems like Oh, no, he probably has a nice car, right? <laughs> He's got bucks. So. I, I wonder if he would call the safety standards for those cars socialist safety sta standards. No, because he has a, his car probably is very safe. He he strikes me as like a like a late model S class Mercedes kind of guy who would remind someone on a date that that he had a late model S class Mercedes. <laughs> Lots of people. <laughs> They'd be like, well, that's something about you. It'll come out of it through different interpretations <laughs> of the underlying central scripture. But then you'll also have lots of people who 
definitely would th- would would either identify say as Christian but they don't really that maybe they've never read their Bible they don't have the slightest idea what's in it they know a few Bible verses maybe that they heard at church but they certainly are not theological most savvy. people who identify as Christian not, have um, never read the Bible I don't know they're not not even really theologically aware they're just they think it's what it means to be a good person and you have other people who would buy into a lot of these kind of things without necessarily even calling themselves Christian, um, especially there in, in Western Europe. You'll run into that quite a lot, but that they're still operating within a broadly Christian framework or that they identify as Christian without knowing the first thing about what Christianity is really about, except for maybe the one first thing you know, about Christ, doesn't change the fact that um, they're still operating within that that underlying theological structure, that their worldview is still organized in terms of that, and that they might still be, um, you know, upholding a system that is, in essence, built out of that and perpetuating that. So I think these Democrats that don't realize that they're playing the part of communism uh, and wouldn't identify that way uh, have subscribed to enough of the theology to be moving the goals of the communists but just like the i think he's got that backwards party he's saying that people who call themselves christian are christian because they agree with one part of the bible and yet people who don't call themselves communist are communist because they don't believe in any part of communism i'm very confused what he means I, that's the, that's because he has, I mean, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. <clears throat> he's got like a few names of a few people he claims are postmodern as scholars and that's fine. Whatever. I don't, I can't rattle off the names of any postmodernist scholars, ex- but <clears throat> like that's, that's just all he does. He keeps naming the same few names and then just saying that basically anything that isn't what he believes to be like traditional what he would call Western values. That's just all communism now. Like it's, it works for the audience that, that he's cultivated because they don't care either. They just want to like, they just want to like suggest that people who disagree with them are bad and they can just use communism as a stand in for bad. And they'll be like, see this genius, whatever is saying that these people are bad. It's, it's, it's not as deep as as he would have you believe. I don't think. Party used to laugh. They had things they called sucker lists, which were influential people, usually progressive religious people, who they could trick into doing communist agenda items or holding or promoting beliefs useful to achieving a communist agenda item without actually um, identifying themselves as communist at all and even sometimes identifying themselves as against it and they call them also useful idiots which is a, a term that most people have heard and they laughed about it and so I think that these people may not identify as or realize that they are participating in a broad communist revolution but they're intricately necessary components to achieving exactly that revolution communism has always been and always will be something very very few people actually support and understand at the same time but it requires getting a lot of people to do uh to take up policy points and things on its behalf in order to get them uh passed in the initial stage so is communism now policy that james doesn't agree with (laughs) i feel like you could say the same thing as what he just said about laissez-faire capitalism like very few people agree with laissez-faire capitalism and very few people know what it is right but it, and it requires policy to for it to be enacted yeah just until that final clamp of power comes down and so i see them within that framework uh people say that it's not fair for me to say that but i think it's just a br- it's just a blunt fact um and it's it's very dangerous. I hope that they can be awakened to what they're contributing to. Hate speech laws are a communist agenda item. They serve nobody's freedom. Um, where where do you, where does anti-first anarchist communist ideology fit into this cultural revolution? In your opinion, I mean, they have 
I mean, they, we, historically speaking, and you know because of your book as well as anybody, you know this is a little bit complicated. But they they are in some sense a kind of on the ground shock troop, but they are also wild and anarchist, right? So they have a different a different model. They I don't think that the Antifa is going to be particularly happy with corporations like BlackRock and Vanguard becoming the de facto rulers of the world, um, and so they are. Again, I think Yuri Beznamov called people like them political prostitutes and said to basically put no energy into them. They just do what they need to, to get done for you, and then you make use of them. And let's pray for Antifa that they don't get their way because they're going to get shot. They're going to get locked up. Every one of those criminals is going to be completely worthless to the new regime once the new regime's in place. So the role that they play is there. Now, philosophically, they're not ambiguous. Antifa write in their own book. There are their own books that they, uh, you know, take their inspiration from characters like Franz Fanon, who had strong Marxist influence. That's a you fucking find an anti-fascist activist and you tell them that name and they'll be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Where are the Proud yep. Boys at? <laughs> <laughs> Algerian post-colonialist uh, in the 50s and 60s. He wrote The Wretched of the Earth in 1962. They he, he advocated violence to throw off colonization and to regain your sense of self. They, they openly... <clears throat> Well, yeah, the, I I feel comfortable advocating violence to resist colonization by another another f like culture. I feel like Americans, <clears throat> if for example, Canada were to just try to start colonizing America, I feel like these. I feel like I don't know. Maybe I'd advocate violence to get them to stop. <laughs> I don't know. Like I don't yeah. know. Th I don't know. At this point, though, I mean, you know, I don't know. Might not be the worst thing that could ever happen, but. He's like, oh, he adver advocated violence against colonizers. It's like, well, yeah, colonization is just another form of invasion, dude. Uh, I am on the side of Ukraine. I wonder what side James Lindsay is on. Uh, embrace him. They openly embrace Herbert Marcuse. They openly embrace the idea of either a Che Guevara style or a Maoist style cultural revolution. Although I don't, I don't think I have to wonder. He's probably on Russia's side. And so they are um, a absolutely crucial uh, paramilitary entity that is strategic enough not to organize, at which point it would have to be cracked down upon uh, beyond um, kind of networking and undergrounding and, and uh, kind of a syndicate kind of style. But they are an integral part of making this thing happen. They are the... They're not quite the Red Guard. They're more like if they were, if they were actually if we just cut the anti crap out, which is a, a, a lie that, that, that they're actually fascist. Uh, they're more like Mussolini's black shirts than they are like anybody else. Um, the brown shirts. Too. How do they dress? I mean, come on. Um, but they just like hey guys, could says, you so stop Bella being Dodd fascist? No, you're the Dodd, fascist. Dodd, Dodd, Dodd this is this is a ridiculous. First of all, the he, he, brown shirts, dude. He said, oh, they're like the black shirts. He doesn't even know what the fuck he's talking about. Like, <clears throat> I can't even, like, he, this guy, like, has such, such a, I, I'm not buying that he has, like, deep knowledge of these sort of philosophers who most people don't know about when he gets, like, just basic facts about well-known historical events, like, wrong. Do you know what I'm saying? Hmm testimony in 1953 to the house on american activities committee or house committee on american activities will say it correctly and she testified as a uh, time Congress for tim foil says Congress mussolini Congress had the black shirts elected, hitler had the brown shirts and she said explicitly ah. they take on nice sounding names for themselves like anti-fascist and then so did he say mussolini the only people are truly I, against fascism. i'm not going so back to everybody who opposes them they say <laughs> it was an anti-anti-fascist and so by the law of double negatives it must be a fascist and it's this kind of i don't know idiotic manichaean kind of thinking that manichaean like he does this like this shit like nobody in their audience knows what manichaean is I don't know what Manichaean is. I don't think you know what Manichaean is. I bet there's probably zero people in our chat who knows what it is. But he does that to like signal to the people in the audience that he knows shit, that he's like an intellectual. It's, do you know what I'm saying? This is what they all do, though. They always like him and Jordan Peterson in particular, like they try to 
confuse their audience so that they sound more intelligent. Right. Entire movement. And so um, there's the part of me that's, you know, human and, you know, gets pissed off that seriously hopes that the communists get their revolution, that Klaus Schwab or whoever else gets what they want. Yes, Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, well-known communist. Get the fuck out of here. Oh, my God. He just called Klaus. He just said that Klaus Schwab is trying to do communism. Oh, my God. Oh, no. But it's always a stand in for like globalism and globalism is always a stand in for like anti-Semitic tropes. It's like generally what this what this when you when you start digging away at the layers of things. You end up at like it's the same old anti-Semitic trips. I don't think Klaus Schwab actually happens to be Jewish, but that doesn't mean that like people aren't using anti-Semitic tropes to talk about him in the World Economic Forum. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Every one of these motherfuckers goes to prison or gets killed because they were on the wrong side of history thinking they're on the right side of history. And I would love to be able to watch it because they put those people down before they put down the resistance, as it turns out. But then there's a part of me that's human in another way. You would love to be able to watch a bunch of really people getting killed. We, uh, don't end up in that fate and that we can turn this thing around before it gets to that point because it's horrific and nobody deserves that, even these poor, deluded political prostitutes. What do you think of the... Uh, this is the argument that Antifa and their allies and supporters and fellow travelers say. They, they say that they have to exist... Their militancy needs to exist because the threat of far right, racist, nationalist, Christo fascist ideology is everywhere, overwhelming, targets people of color and minorities, and that they need to exist to operate as protectors of these communities because the state being systematically racist and homophobic and you know, all these other uh, pho phobias that they list out, that they therefore, they therefore must organize and um, do their direct action, which their MO primarily, um, when it's on the street, is to directly assault and fight and or kill if need their political opponents. And then the whole online world, it's the doxing and... Just real quick, you mentioned killing. If you get a chance, everybody, if you're listening on the pod or you're watching the show, look up Andy No Cider Riot. He was there when they fucking killed somebody. Not Antifa either. I'm talking about the Proud Boys. Look up Andy No Cider Riot. I don't have time to get into it right now, but it's like really interesting that he like brings it up in this way. Yeah, I was like on board halfway through that, and then all of a sudden he's like, and like they're gonna kill their political opponents. And it's like, no, that's the opposite of what they want to do. Um, working with like uh, larger um, uh, institutions, SPLC, et cetera, working yes, with the Southern Poverty Law Center. Oh, my God. Uh, reputation smearing a target. So that's, that's a long question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. Um, first, I'll actually point out that their primary tactic is what's called mid-level violence. It's a form of political violence where you are engaging in a type of provocation that's just like a toe over the line or a foot over the line without going all the way over the line. And they do that specifically because they either want you to back down, in which case they win, or they want you to react, in which case they will film you and make it look like you overreacted so they can create the smear campaign to destroy you and force you to back down or force you I mean, to he's, silence. He's describing like um, what people on the right do every day. He's describing the act of provocation just more broadly. Big like, brother I'm, does, I'm big not brother, saying people big on brother, the left. A big brother will do it to a little brother. One cat will do it to another cat. <laughs> right? He's just describing the act of provocation. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm not trying to say that people on the left don't do that. I'm just saying people on the right do that every day. So like, why why is he saying? And this is the left's tactic. 
or <clears throat> Antifa's tactic. It's like <clears throat> it's people do it in apolitical scenarios all the time. Yeah. Like Scientologists, they have a thing they do called bull baiting, like where they'll just like kind of harass somebody until that person smacks the camera out of the, the, the camera person's, you know, they like all kinds of people do this. It's just called provoking someone else. We have a word for it. You don't need to fucking, you don't need to get all complicated about it. Yeah. And I'm also not saying that it's good or justified. Manipulation. I'm just saying he's, yeah, he's describing it as if it's actually well documented. We're just politically, in terms of this thing that only occurs on the left. We're all fairly ignorant, but Antifa's not. Now, as for their claim that they need to exist, I'll give them some credit. In the 1940s and 50s, when they were coming together, 30s, there was some truth to that. But this is not true any longer. So it's just a BS pretext so they can keep living out Herbert Marcuse's wet dream of re refusing the entire society and pretending that we live in a state that he does he think does tolerance. he not think that there's a fascist rise I don't like know what globally? he thinks I only know what he's saying HK and what he's what he's saying here is he's literally he's he's describing provocation and acting like I guess Herbert Marcuse fucking invented it or something like <laughs> I don't know like he's using this. You remember when everybody was freaking out about Saul Alinsky and then none of them knew who Saul Alinsky was. Saul Alinsky wrote rules for radicals. Like this is the same thing. Like this is just, this is just what people do to people that they're, they don't like people just provoke people. They don't like people fuck with people. They don't like people provoke. Somebody's provoking somebody at a fucking bar right now. where the right wing, the Christo fascists and all of these people are actually recruiting and actively growing and that these communities actually needed protection. I'm sorry, guys, that died. That's not real. That stopped being real in Western nations a long time ago. I'm not saying that there's no right wing fanatics. I'm not saying that's true. I'm saying that actually there's no need to protect from them through street militancy any longer. That's a fantasy uh, that's dead at least 40 years and you can say whatever you want i would disagree about that uh just look at all of the the fucking armed right wingers who come and protest like libraries when there's a a drag drag queen story hour yeah and not for nothing i forget the name of this guy's pal he's pa pals with this christian nationalist guy we watched a couple videos of it. Do you remember this video where they were kind of sitting outside kind of near a large body of water and he was talking to some older guy? You were probably on the show. I forget the name of the fucking organization. It's like on the tip of my tongue, but he's like, he gets funding from this. I forget the guy's name now. And it's, it's, he's talking about Christo fascism. The guy that he's getting a lot of his funding from is a Christo fascist. I just, I just can't remember the name of the guy or the organization right now. Maybe somebody in chat knows. Okay. Somebody so he's probably purposefully trying to play it down. Probably. I mean, I, 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 I think he might be a true believer. I don't know. I, I can't read his mind. I just, I just know he keeps fucking stepping in it all the time, you know? person shaking a little bit loose from antifa and that mentality what i would tell them is you are they you and sovereign nations is the name of the group which doesn't sound fascist at all <laughs> are the primary cause of the thing that you claim to be fighting so you're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy you're pissing people off to the point where they react against you and they become reactionaries because you're using these mid-level violence provocations that piss people off and don't give them uh, due pathways to recourse. So they're left with, well, if you're going to make me look bad, I'm going to deserve to look bad. And then you have entities like the Proud Boys showing up and being total dickheads. So they are creating the thing that, ju that they use to justify their own existence, which in other words is snake oil. The best case what? that they can make for themselves is a snake oil argument that okay uh, so snake oil he doesn't know what the fuck snake oil is historically either right <laughs> snake oil yeah it's legitimately for a while it might have just been they just might have been using oil derived from a snake saying it was a cure-all but snake oil is generally either like it may not necessarily be used for some kind of medical cure-all but that's where it comes from so what he's talking about is he just doesn't he has no idea what the fuck snake oil is like how it's used. Yeah, so he's he's saying that like it causes the thing that it's supposed to cure. But like first of all, 
snake oil doesn't cause anything usually. And second of all, it's like it's it's meant to cure everything. Right. Right. It's a it's a you know, like homeopathy is we, we could call that snake oil. We it's a it's a broad term that we generally use for medical treatments that have no evidence for their eff- efficacy, right? That's what Dr. Oz yeah. got rich on. Yep. And uh yeah, it has nothing to do with what he's talking about. This guy doesn't know anything. Like every time he refers to something like <clears throat> just something cultural that's fairly modern, he just fucking he just it's just n- nonsensical. So then why am I supposed to trust him like about what some old dead philosopher believed? If he can't even tell me what the fuck snake oil is like, (laughs) I mean, everybody, like, even if they can't give you a definition, they can give you some sort of like, like, okay, this is kind of what snake oil means, right? Not everybody, but the vast majority of people know what the fuck, if you say, oh, that, that doesn't work. It's snake oil. They know what you mean, but he thinks, he thinks it's like a snake oil is like some kind of like self-perpetuating cultural phenomena. And that's just like way off from what we mean when we say snake oil. Yeah. He thinks that like snake oil is going to cause a problem and then cure it. Now the snake oil salesman may tell you, you have a problem you don't have. Yeah. But I mean, now I'm just trying to be charitable. Fuck that. Uh, Because (laughs) what was historically no longer is, and their idea that systems and structures are infinitely self-perpetuating, which is a Marxist belief about how the bourgeoisie rig society and, you know, dictate ideologies to keep themselves in power and to exclude certain uh, other voices, is actually just a projection. Wait, does he disagree with that? Again, why? As political prostitutes, they should really think twice about what they're supporting because they're not useful to a regime except destabilizing the existing thing. Destabilizers are not useful to a regime that wants to be sustainable. And so they're going to be done away with or locked up. Hold on. <clears throat> so these actions we saw with, with uh, Antifa and the Proud Boys, it was literally like the Proud Boys would bust in a bunch of people. Usually we saw it in Portland. Uh, they'd bust in a bunch of people. A bunch of people in Portland were like, oh, nope, 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 nope. No, 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 no. Don't, don't come here and harass my community. And they'd go out there and they were willing to fight. And that was it. Mm-hmm. And then if you ever, you know, ain't no proud boys in Portland today, ain't no Antifa out on the fucking street. That's it. Generally, yep. a, <clears throat> generally community defense. Do some of the people in these things do shit that's probably bad? Sure, whatever. But people do bad shit all the time. Like we can't really, we can't really hold that standard up for any group, right? That, oh, all the people in here have to be pure. Like you can't do that with any group. <clears throat> so it's like. This guy's just got it all wrong, but uh, maybe maybe I, maybe it's because I don't understand his new definition of snake oil. And if I understood the new definition of snake <laughs> oil, I would be able to understand what the fuck he's talking about better. I don't know. I would say like Antifa doesn't mean anything if there's no fa to be anti against. Yeah. Yeah. And like, uh, there's just such a history of this, like, like in like in in the in the eighties, a version of Antifa was they were called Sharps. They were skinheads against racial prejudice, and they had to run all the fucking all the Nazi punks out of the venues because you know about the Nazi bar, right? You let one Nazi in, then all your other patrons leave, and now you're not now your bar's full of Nazis. Well, they didn't want that happening at the punk venues, and then eventually, like they they believed that they had to whoop that ass to cause that to happen, and that's what they did, and um, you yep. know. Now there's no more sharps because there's the, the fucking, the proud boys know the stay the fuck away from a punk show, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. or house arrested or put on the most strict forms of social credit limiting, uh, that anybody in the society is going to have, and they can whine and cry and piss and moan and try to mid-level violence, a regime, a real regime not a free country that allows them to get away with mid-level violence and see what happens to them. They wouldn't get away with this shit in China. I'll tell you that right now. The Chinese government, if somebody tried to do what Antifa does in China, would smash their asses so hard, they'd all be in standing room only prisons under Tiananmen Square until they die. That only works in free countries. It only works. Wait, what would the Chinese government do to a group like the Proud Boys? They'd smash that shit down too, right? Mm-hmm. 
in the place where exactly that is not what they say. So they're selling snake oil. They're they've diluted themselves, or and they're selling that's snake homeopathy. Oil to justify being little assholes. That's that's my opinion of them. Shifting gears a bit. So just in my thirty minutes speaking with you, and you know, and I knew this beforehand. You are very calm, and of course, well informed. Uh, he seems calm well informed i don't know i don't know he gave us a really dumb he gave us a really incorrect definition of a very common term but whatever great speaker um, great speaker oh no y'all are both the black hole know, of charisma I on your social media i on twitter i would get this perception that you've been permanently suspended for a repeated hate speech um i want to give you the opportunity to sort of uh, going back to the, that okay groomer question at the beginning why why, why, in your mind, was that a good um, response to describe the people leading a lot of this brainwashing and why you... What kind of brainwashing, you, Andy? Even you mean that makes Twitter. people gay, Andy? Uh, when Twitter was being placed under pressure to censor people for using um, that word, that you, in my understanding, continue with anyways and... and paid a pretty heavy price. You've lost access to a big platform. You worked really hard to build up a large audience on there. Obviously, you have other things you're doing as well. But um, yeah, to lose access to that large audience is a big deal, I think. Yeah, well, um, so there are two primary uh, reasons why OK Groomer was was fantastic. One of, is, one of those is rhetorical and one of those is um, descriptive the descriptive reason is very simple they are groomers who uh, they are groomers into an ideology they're cult groomers that cult grooming is into topics of sex and sexuality and gender in ways that actually require introducing things like sexual conversations sexuality conversations gender conversations sexual topics sometimes the viewing of pornography sometimes questionable materials like the book gender queer that have graphic drawings or cartoons, but they're still graphic drawings of, of, of one teenager performing oral sex on another. Uh, uh, technically not because it's on a strapped on sex toy, but whatever you want to make of that. <laughs> this book what the sounds hell is he based. talking about? This book sounds based. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I haven't read this book, but like, we're just going to let it, I, I'm going to save my kind of thoughts on his suspension and his little martyr act until he's got uh, done, um, maybe incorrectly describing what he was doing maybe maybe it's a very graphic book and so this idea of these things happening and then well we're going to use this as a vehicle to initiate and then promote social transition that we're then going to hide from your parents and this positioning of the 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 facilitators in the school whatever they are teachers administrators nurses social workers whatever their role their specific job their facilitators the facilitators of this process not only advocating hiding this from the parents but then also pushing it along further and further wait someone um, actively the only time i've ever heard anyone advocating hiding something from the parents is when a kid says like hey i'm gay and my parents are like extremely anti-gay should i come out to them like the usual answer is no wait until you are moved out are financially independent from them and then if you want to you can tell them but i wouldn't tell them before that or you could be end up in a bad situation Right. And I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what each individual educator does, but what you're saying sounds like a pretty reasonable response. And even if there's no policy on it, just like a decent person would probably have that response. But he's yeah. claiming that they're, that the, the, you know, the administration or whatever is trying to like push this on people. And I feel like that's just like, just like a lot of extra work that teachers don't have time for. <laughs> like even just like on a practical, as a practical matter, you know? Like no one's saying, don't tell your parents gender isn't binary. Right. Positioning themselves as the, 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 um, equal and the, 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 the friend and helper of the students, uh, while they're positioning the parents, for example, as a potential danger. If you have to hide something from your parents, maybe they won't understand you. We have to protect you from them. We have to protect you from your parents. There's no better word for that than grooming. So on a technical, no, the, no, no, no. Grooming literally means something very specific, at least in the context yep. he's using it. 
It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean, oh, you told me this. I don't think you should tell this other person this. There is actually a, a much better word for that than grooming. Education. <laughs> uh, assisted self-preservation. Best word to describe what's actually going on. Now, in a rhetorical sense, and it's not the word groomer, it's the phrase, okay, groomer, uh, is rhetorically awesome. First of all, it's just dismissive. that You can say it back to anything and therefore it has like infinite power we learned that with okay boomer once you introduce which is the other reason it's rhetorically awesome i just stole one of their things and reappropriated it back against them which is awesome you remember we have that chirpy pretty girl dancing around okay boomer one of their things shirt. no matter what the boomer says <laughs> who is they as a boomer you don't have to answer their argument you don't have to engage like young people okay, boomer and it's over there's nothing they can say. It's very dismissive. Like his, it's very, his age uh, range is very powerful. the age range that would say, okay, boomer. Right. He's probably, I think he's around my age, right? 40, 40 yeah. early 40s, mid 40s. Like he's not a boomer. He's younger than a boomer. That's the age range that would say, okay, boomer. Right. His parents are probably boomers. Does he think that it's political? Right. Because it was, it, sometimes it was political, but it was more about being out of touch. Yeah. And I mean, as you get older, sometimes, I mean, there's things like sometimes I'm out of touch, right? Like some 20 year old fucking wants to start talking to me. I'm probably going to be out of touch about this, that, or the other thing. Might listen to him though. You never know. They might, they might know some shit. I don't know. You know, powerful rhetorically in that regard. And okay. Groomer does the same thing as if we all should have permission not to listen to somebody who's a groomer about their tortured arguments for why they should be allowed to continue grooming children. Wait, what? Uh, and I will say that I don't believe the majority of these people are pedophiles, but if we were to... But no, that's the left. implication, and that's why you got kicked off of Twitter, you dumb fuck. Yeah, it's not just the implication. Like, that's... That is what he means. I don't know what he means, but that's the implication. That's how it's heard by the vast majority of people when someone calls you a groomer, unless you're, like, literally, like, work at Petco. And then you, you <laughs> <laughs> right? But that's different. <laughs> Left's logic about systems and structures, we would say that they're supporting structural pedophilia because Wait, pedophilia is occurring. There are children that are being victimized. There Wait, now are do the Catholic Church by people who are taking them down this path, and thus the entire apparatus of supporting that would be under their own line of thought structural pedophilia what? Uh, that they're engaging in but we've seen what, what 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 would happen andy if you were say a structural racist well they just drop it you're a racist you're supporting racism so these people are just pedophiles and they're just supporting pedophilia by their logic which of course so does he sad. think that all christians are just pedophiles then because a lot of christian churches are structurally pedophilia what did he say um, like a better, I think a better way to say it is like, it, does he think everyone who's a Catholic is complicit in what the Catholic church has done? Yeah. And the answer to that is clearly no, not even most churches didn't do that. Yeah. Most pastors, most priests didn't do that. This is dumb. This is an, <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till he's done here. Cause I have like a, like kind of a broader point and like a, like a, like a point about him and what I believe to be like his own narcissistic behavior and how that like plays into that. But I'm going to wait a second here. We're going to have a double standard where they get to play that game. Uh, this okay. Groomer thing hits right back into that, the other direction. And obviously it proved that they couldn't get the, 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 the stink hit them and they could not get the stink off of them. It's like they got sprayed by a skunk and they just could not wash it off the groomer thing has stuck they can't get away from the groomer thing their attempt to block people like me and now colin wright and other people for kind of challenging some of this stuff uh, libs of tiktok is under kind of constant threat for this has been banned permanently from facebook um gays against groomers got banned <laughs> permanently for being anti-LGBT. Uh, they're literally a 100% gay organization and they're apparently homophobic now because- How do you know that? Groomer. Um, they're just a Twitter account. is revealing to more and more and more people that there's something to this. I can't tell you, I got probably a thousand emails. Uh, the thing emails to it or... is called slander. Well, <clears throat> I mean, slander is a legal term in, in the United States. Slander and defamation are pretty hard to prove. 
Um, but like, he was like, oh, this Twitter account was a hundred percent gay organization. How the fuck do you know that? It's just a Twitter account. For all we know, it was James Lindsay. <laughs> right? Like, such a crazy thing to say. Or whatever. After I got kicked off of Twitter, and this was just two weeks ago, I probably got a thousand messages of people saying, I thought you were going too far with the groomer thing, and now I believe it completely. Now I believe that that's exactly what they're doing, and they're trying to send Who's they? They don't want people to see it. And... I think it therefore is a so in other words he convinced thousands of people to hate their own countrymen for a completely made up reason yes yes that's been his project for a while I, I will point out on a very technical level I did not get kicked off of Twitter for okay groomer I got suspended for 12 hours from Twitter or locked out for 12 hours for OK Groomer, after which I deleted all of my OK Groomer tweets. Every tweet where I called somebody a groomer, I went and deleted them all proactively because I knew they were going to try to target my account with it. And so I deleted them all. What I actually got kicked out of Twitter permanently for was OK Child Sexualization Specialist, which I thought was a clever way to reword the similar idea. But no, that's worse. <laughs> Because you said that to like a specific fucking person and then all of your fucking followers started harassing that person. Oh my, like, what the fuck? I'm unfamiliar with this story. It's fine. He just, he, what he said is accurate. I mean, he called, I forget who it was. It was just, I think it might've just been some random person too, who like didn't agree with him. It wasn't like, wasn't like he was going after somebody who had a big following like him. And then like that person was then subject to harassment. Like, and what happens is once these, once people, once the stuff leaves Twitter and people start harassing folks, like calling them, uh, writing them letters, calling their employer because of like these harassment campaigns, then Twitter will take whoever the leader is off. I don't know for a fact that that happened here, but I'm guessing that that happened here. Um, Hmm. use the g word and so i actually believe i got kicked out of twitter permanently for beating a leftist at a word game which they don't tolerate very well so uh, everything that you're saying i mean well, okay i'm going to give my thoughts here now the, this is the best thing he thinks it's the best thing that ever happened to him him getting kicked off twitter and i think this is going to be as good a place as any to like end the podcast part of the show because we're an hour hour 20 in or so um this he thinks this is the best thing that ever happened to him he gets to go on this like little little woe is me tour and <clears throat> he couldn't stop he knew that if he did not stop what he was doing and by what he was doing, I mean targeting harassment at individuals who just happened to be queer because they were queer, which is what he was doing. Um, it wasn't even people like me who are like loudmouths and have a show. Like, it's all in the game, baby. You know what I'm saying? If somebody starts saying that shit to me, I'm on here every night talking, right? I have some, like, recourse. I have some, like, group of people that will come to my aid. Some group of people on the internet who will, will go hard in the paint for me. You know what I'm saying? He was doing this to mm -hmm. people who don't even have 50 people watching a Twitch channel. And I eventually I'm telling you what probably happened is one of those people's fucking family member or good friend of theirs was some kind of powerful person, some kind of, some kind of influential person. Maybe it was like a Senator's fucking nephew or niece. Do you know what I'm saying? Because you do that to enough people just because that person ain't got no power doesn't mean they don't have access to the levers of power through someone else. And I'm almost sure that that's what happened. You know how like Jordy Pete was talking all kind of shit about people getting mutilated by their doctor. And then he said it about Elliot page and then whoop, and he had to pull down the tweet. I'm guessing like that happened to him, but like a degree of separation away. Like he didn't know that the person he was doing that to, you know, uh, mom is the CTO of, you know, fucking Oracle or just something like that. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I'm guessing that's probably how this happened, but he knew what he was doing and he knew 
that his followers were going to harass individuals and that that harassment would leave Twitter and Twitter will take almost no action until that harassment starts leaving Twitter. And if that harassment is homophobic, racist, or in this case, probably transphobic, uh, all like if I was going to guess, then they will act because it looks bad on them because things have like escaped the, uh, they've <laughs> escaped the metaverse. I don't know. They've escaped the screen essentially and started causing real world problems. And that can cause real world problems for the corporation we call Twitter. And I think he knew what he was doing. And I think he is going to try to ride this for like fame. I think he miscalculated though, because he has no charisma. <laughs> it's hard to run this grift without charisma. And I think he severely lacks it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. And like, not for nothing, like just, just yesterday, a fucking children's hospital had to shut down because somebody who believes some of the things that not James Lindsay, but libs of TikTok and Matt Walsh were saying about Boston children's hospital. Uh, they were calling uh, gender affirming care. They were calling it mutilation. Someone who believed that called in a bomb threat and they locked down the hospital. And so I think we're going to see a lot of these accounts <clears throat> get nuked because I hope so. I do too, because that's a children's hospital for fuck's sake. <laughs> I mean, like what kind of, what kind of like monster, what kind of monster audience, monster community are you going to create that does that will cause a children's hospital to go on lockdown, right? That's just fucking terrorism, like just straight up terrorism. And not for nothing, like a lot of times, and <clears throat> I think that the, the, a lot of right-wingers have done a really good job of playing the ref. Like if, if you're not going to win the argument, you might as well just try to win the ref, right? Get the ref to like agree that you're being treated unfairly. So they've been trying to play the ref this whole time. And the ref is Twitter. The ref is Facebook. The ref is Instagram. The ref, they, they ain't done a good job of playing the ref over at TikTok. TikTok will just kick you the fuck off. Same with Twitch. Twitch will just kick you the fuck off. They won't even tell you why on Twitch. And generally it's like, you don't, you don't get kicked off of here for nothing. So, but I think at this point, their ability to play the ref when Twitter is going to be like, boy, it would suck if people thought I was in favor of a children's hospital or biased in the direction of a children's hospital. Well, no, actually that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> it's okay to be biased in favor of the fucking children's hospital. There's like, such a small segment of society that would think it would be bad for you to be biased in favor of the children's hospital that I think that this, this one, this one went out too far. And I think that we're going to start seeing, we're going to see maybe not Matt Walsh or the daily wire, just because the daily wire is a fairly popular publication, but that libs of TikTok account's going to be gone. And a lot of the, a lot of the like middle, like level people that have been doing this, I don't know their names even, but a lot of people, maybe they have 80,000, 100,000 followers or whatever that are doing this thing. A lot of those people, you're going to start seeing them getting kicked off because Twitter wants to be able to tell their shareholders and their advertisers that actually know after that children's hospital incident, we put the kibosh on this. That was a bridge too far. We can't have that happening. I hope so. I'm not as optimistic as you are about Twitter. Uh, I think Twitter will do as little as possible as late as possible. Oh, I think this is as little as possible as late as possible. There was a terrorist threat made at a children's hospital HK. I mean, this is like not a, this isn't one of those. Well, I don't know. There's two sides to this one. There's like even like right wing people probably would generally be like, well, let's not, let's go ahead and not, do the children's hospital thing. <laughs> yeah, but I've been surprised before about what Twitter is okay with, and I will probably be surprised again. So I'm uh I'm hopeful, but I don't expect much. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um tonight I'm gonna read the show out. Um we usually end with boomers, but I'm gonna end with a song <clears throat> end with a song called Then Gwen. Um, when I was young, 
in uh, Newark, California, a trans woman named Gwen Arujo was uh, murdered at a party. This is an NVS song about that. I don't want to get into the details mm-hmm. of it. Don't feel like crying on stream. Um, it happened 15 miles from where I lived, and it was disgusting. Uh, this song uh, by NVS is about that. And uh, shout out to Walter and Kyle and River and Micah and everybody over at the uh, band NVS. And we'll be back for Red Light in just a minute. Thanks for listening to the Intellectual Dollar Tree. <laughs> If you like what we're doing at Echoplex and aren't into Twitch, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash Echoplex. For $5, you can get every show from beginning to end sent to you as an MP3, even the stuff we bleep out because it's too spicy for Twitch. Echoplex would not be where we are today if it wasn't for the community support we receive. Find out all the ways you can support the show at echoplexmedia.com slash support.